that uh, you guys see in the PowerPoint? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. All right, um, I'm going to be covering uh, Stormwater General Permit 3-9050, which is its official name. Um, most of you, most of us, I'm calling it the uh, three acre permit, the three acre general permit. Uh, quickly, before I get into it, you know, I, th I think we've got a, a big range of folks there here. Uh, you see, we've got some engineers who work in stormwater permitting, and I think some other folks who are perhaps a little new to, to stormwater. Um, our program consists of 13 folks. We're part of the Watershed Management Division at DEC. Uh, we implement several different permit programs, um, including uh, a program for construction activities that disturb one or more acres. Uh, we've got a municipal program called the MS4, which stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System that applies to a dozen or so of our larger municipalities. The TS4, which is like the MS4, but it applies to VTRANS and our multi-sector general permit, which applies to industrial activities. Um, we currently have uh, over 4,000 actively regulated sites. Um, focus of my talk today concerns operational permitting. Um, we used to call that state stormwater permitting or post-construction. Operational permitting refers to managing stormwater from impervious surfaces. Impervious surfaces are hard surfaces that water runs off of rather than through. Um, it includes parking lots, roofs, roads, sidewalks, etc. And generally, when we talk about operational permitting, we're talking about um, new projects with an acre or more uh, impervious surface. Uh, just sort of to back up big picture, um, when we talk about impervious surfaces in Vermont, we've got about 60,000 acres, roughly. And less than 10% of that is currently regulated under uh, both our operational permit program and our MS4 program. Uh, the reason for that is the vast majority of development in the state predated stormwater regulations and a good chunk of um, current development is subjurisdictional, meaning it's, it's below our, our current permit threshold of one acre. And that's kind of just the way things were um, until fairly recently when EPA uh, revoked and then reissued uh, the Lake Champlain phosphorus TMDLs. That was around 2015. I think they were completed in 2016. It was a multi-year process. As part of the uh, reissuance of the TMDLs, uh, EPA and, and, and the department working with EPA identified that stormwater runoff um, contributes about 20% of the phosphorus load to the lake. Those two slices of the pie chart in the upper right corner, developed lands, including paved roads and unpaved roads combined equal about 20% of the phosphorus load to the lake. Um, the, the TMDLs identified that in order to meet the phosphorus targets for the lake, we needed to reduce phosphorus and stormwater from 21%. So again, stormwater makes up about 20% of the load and we need to reduce it also by about 20%. So how is that to be achieved? Um, the TMDLs and Act 64, which is also known as the Vermont Clean Water Act of 2015, uh, identified several, a, a range of measures that needed to take place. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that's not related to stormwater. It's regard, you know, relates to to agriculture, wastewater, et cetera. But the stormwater requirements coming out of both the Act and the TMDLs and the Phase One implementation plan for the TMDLs identified that the stormwater program needed to develop and implement uh, a municipal roads general permit, uh, which was done and applies to all municipalities in the state. Um, under the MS4 general permit, we have uh, included a requirement for municipalities to develop phosphorus control plans to address phosphorus from um, impervious surfaces within the MS4's purview. Um, the phosphorus control plan there needs to reduce phosphorus uh, consistent with the reduction targets for the specific lake segment. Uh, same applies to the under the TS4 general permit, that is VTRANS is developing a phosphorus control plan. Um, 
Act 64 also directed us to develop a new stormwater permitting rule, and this the subject of today's talk, the three acre general permit. I'll be touching on a stormwater rule um, a little bit uh, because it sort of it ties in quite a bit with um, general permit 9050, the three acre general permit. Stormwater rule is adopted. It went into effect in March of 2019. And it covers all our stormwater programs. We used to operate under three different rules and directly under statute and federal regulations. So we've combined all that stuff into one nice long stormwater rule. Um, it does also, you know, it, it establishes the technical requirements for three acre sites. Those technical requirements are included in the general permit, but they were first established in, in the rule. So back to the general permit. Again, it is 3-9050. For operational stormwater discharges. It covers three acre sites, um, new development, redevelopment, and permit renewal. If you work in the world of stormwater or if you have a stormwater permit, you know that before we issued 9050, we were working under two different general permits, 3-9015 uh, and 3-9010, uh, a project that needed a, um, a new permit would apply under 9015, and then when they renewed, they'd go to 9010, and then unfortunately, if they underwent an expansion, they'd go back to 9015. And we also issued a, a good number of individual permits because under our general permits, we were not able to um, issue coverage for projects in stormwater impaired waters that did not have a TMDL. So um, this new general permit covers all those categories in one general permit. And it went into effect uh, just over a month ago, December 1st. There's not much that is new in that in the general permit that is not a that is, you know, other than the requirements for three acre sites. So the requirements for new projects and for permit renewal um, essentially haven't changed. So everything that's new pretty much pertains to three acre sites. Uh, the uh, general permit defines what a three acre site is. And actually, again, the, the, the rule first established that definition, but and to paraphrase those, those definitions, a three acre site is a single lot um, that has three or more acres of impervious surface where there was no stormwater permit issued or where we issued a permit before 2002. Um, the legislature established that 2002 cutoff because it lines up with when the legislature first adopted the Vermont Stormwater Management Manual. Stormwater Management Manual uh, generally being, uh, you know, the, the point at which we entered a uh, more modern era of stormwater management. So again, if you've got a single lot with three acres, no permit, you're a three acre site. Or if you're a single lot with an older permit, pre-2002, you're a three acre site and subject to the requirements of a three under the general permit. Additionally, uh, multi-lot projects. So picture a residential subdivision. Um, let's say there's no single lot with three or more acres of impervious surface, but if we issued a permit for that project, again, pre-2002, then that project is a three acre site. We have a lot of subdivisions that have no stormwater permits. They predate our regulations. Um, and in some, you know, in many cases, I suspect, the sum total of the impervious surface of the, of the lots would exceed three acres. However, um, if we never issued a permit and no single lot is more than three, they are not a three acre site. We had to draw the line somewhere and that's how we did it. Um, additionally, um, some campus type situations, universities, hospitals and so forth, um, where um, a portion of the, the facility is a three acre site, you know, adjacent, parcels that are part of that campus are also considered part of the three acre site. Just as a heads up, I'm not monitoring the, the chat. My thought is um, we could go to questions uh, once I've gotten through the slides. I think I've got, you know, just roughly a half hour worth, so we should have plenty of time for questions afterwards. But if there's something glaringly amiss, uh, flag me down. Um, and we have roughly a thousand three acre sites statewide. Um, we've you know, mapped the impervious cover and overlaid it with parcels within the Lake Champlain uh, basin. We've not done uh, the rest of the state. So 
you know, we've got 700 roughly in the Champlain and, and Lake Memphremagog watersheds. We're extrapolating to the rest of the state to come up with a thousand based on population. Um, of the 1,000 three acre sites, roughly half are previously permitted. If you have been to the stormwater programs website uh, for the new general permit 3-9050, uh, you'll have seen we have a list of three acre sites. Um, this list is based on our existing, um, well, you know, our existing permit records in our database. So for those projects where we have a permit for more than three acres, those projects are included. Additionally, using GIS, we've identified currently unpermitted three acre sites. Um, they're listed by, by town. Um, this list doesn't constitute um, an official determination. So we certainly have had some projects contact us um, with questions as to whether or not they you know, really are a three acre site. And, and you know, where, where people believe we've made, um, you know, determined them to be a three acre site in error, we can certainly review that. You know, for example, right off the bat, as soon as we published this list, someone contacted us and you know, pointed out that the parcel data that we had for, for their particular area was old and that their lot, which we saw as one lot, was in fact two. So they were no longer a three acre site. We've been out to a handful of sites where people have said, no, 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 that, that area out back where we parked our cars, that's not impervious surface. We've gone out and checked it out and we might have agreed with them in, in the cases that so far that where we've been out, um, we did not. Um, you know, we, we, we concluded that it was impervious surface and that they were appropriately categorized as a three acre site. But again, you know, if you're, you know, if you're, if you have questions about a particular site, just get in touch with us. You know, we, we don't need to um, jump to a, you know, a formal appeal at this point. Act 64. Uh, again, the Clean Water Act uh, established um, timeframes for for uh, deadlines for affected projects to obtain permit coverage, and established that no later than 2023 projects in the Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog watersheds need to obtain permit coverage, and the stormwater impaired waters as well, almost all of which are in the Lake Champlain watershed, and the rest of the state. Um, required to obtain permit coverage by 2033. Now that those are just the, the backstop deadlines. Uh, the general permit itself establishes a much more specific schedule, you know, acknowledging that we can't um, process 700, 700 applications all at once, nor can we provide technical assistance, nor can the engineering community probably, you know, deal with processing 700 projects at once. So we've done our best to spread them out. So um, if you were to read the general permit, you'll see that the, the deadlines are essentially broken into two categories. Um, permit coverage for previously permitted sites where all or a portion of the site is currently under a stormwater permit. They need to apply for coverage as a three acre site uh, prior to the expiration of that permit. We do also have a couple hundred projects in the predominantly in the stormwater impaired waters that are currently expired. Um, many of those have been expired for years or decades even. Uh, they have faced uh, legal obstacles to renewing their, renewing their permit. Um, under this new general permit, those obstacles are removed and they are able and required to apply for permit coverage. Those projects need to apply uh, within a year by December 1st of 2021. When um, a previously permitted site applies for coverage, they have to apply for the whole site. A lot of sites that have a permit, the permit doesn't necessarily cover everything that is on all the impervious surface on the site. So when they apply, they come in, covers everything. I think I skipped a site. Yep. Yeah. All right. So for the other half, roughly, of the projects that are currently unpermitted, um, we we based the, the the permit application schedule based on watershed. 
And I don't know, we're talking about watersheds for Lake Champlain. We're using the watersheds for the TMDL lake segments. The TMDLs are broken up. There are actually multiple TMDLs um, for different lake segments. So for projects in the watersheds of um, Siskoi Bay, Main Lake, Burlington Bay, and Shelburne Bay, the application deadline is January 1, 2022. All other Champlain Lake segments, June 1st, 2022. Uh, stormwater impaired watersheds um, are also January 1st, 2022. And projects within Lake Memphis Magog, January 1, 2023. Um, as noted earlier, the rest of the state, so let's say you're in the Connecticut River watershed, um, you need to apply for permit coverage no later than October 1st, 2033. Um, we got comments on the general permit asking if that was a typo. It's it's not, that's that's straight from statute. Um, when we, um, you know, our general permits are valid for five years. So we'll be reissuing the general permit uh, probably twice before that date comes along, the 2033 date. Um, so as we get closer, we'll provide a more specific schedule. So what are the technical requirements? All right, we've identified you as a three acre site. We've notified you, told you that you need to apply by a certain date. What do you need to do? Um, you know, again, the, the, the goal here is to address stormwater from existing development that either doesn't have a stormwater system or it has a, a you know an antiquated stormwater system that isn't providing a sufficient level of treatment. Um, so the requirements are essentially that the stormwater system on the site be retrofitted or installed if there isn't one, and also to maximize the stormwater treatment provided on site. The technical standards that the project needs to be designed to are in the Vermont Stormwater Management Manual. Um, typically, the manual is applied to new projects and includes a uh, half dozen different treatment standards that projects need to meet. You know, understanding that retrofitting an existing development is a lot different than designing a stormwater system for a new project. The standards that three acre sites need to meet are less than uh, a new project would. They need to meet the redevelopment standard, which is 50% of the water quality volume. Uh, the redevelopment standard and the water quality treatment standard are designed to uh, remove sediment and nutrients like phosphorus from stormwater. Um, a new project would also be designing towards certain flood, uh, flood prevention standards. Additionally, projects in stormwater impaired waters also need to meet the channel protection standard. The channel protection standard is um, based on the detention of the one year storm. Now, for new projects, it's designed to prevent the degradation of stream channels that results from increases in storm flow when a project is, you know, goes from undeveloped, say forested, to developed, you know, houses, lawns, parking lots, etc. In the case of the stormwater impaired waters, retrofitting existing development to the channel protection standard is essential for meeting the stormwater TMDLs for those watersheds. In those cases, we need to bring the high flows down in order to meet targets. And by projects retrofitting and meeting the channel protection standard, they will be reducing those, those channel forming flows. As noted, um, you know, designing a stormwater system for a existing developed site is a lot different than designing one for a new site. So as engineers uh, design their stormwater system, they will undertake an engineering feasibility analysis to assess the site constraints you know, for each site to determine the level of stormwater treatment that they are able to install. Um, these criteria, uh, engineering feasibility analysis or EFA criteria, uh, were established in the rule. They are included in the general permit and to paraphrase them here, Projects don't need to purchase additional land for their stormwater system. Uh, they don't need to install stormwater systems that are going to cause them to lose the use of you know, structures, utilities, roads, or, or compromise the existing land use. Projects don't need to pump stormwater. They don't need to infiltrate it if infiltration is going to result in you know, basement flooding or disruption to um, you know, existing contaminated groundwater or contaminated soil. They don't need to construct in floodplains or wetlands. 
Uh, projects don't need to undertake the destruction of forested areas where the forest is um, 5,000 square feet or greater and where that forested area will remain protected under the terms of the stormwater permit. And also projects don't need to attempt to undertake activities that are not approvable under a permit. Um, that could be a state, local, or or federal permit. So if you've got, you know, for whatever reason, if uh, installing a stormwater system is not permittable under your local zoning, then they you know that then the project does not need to undertake that. And, you know, again, projects do need to maximize the amount of stormwater treatment they can provide on site where they can't meet the standard, you know, in whole or in part, then they will be required to pay stormwater impact fees. Fees were also established in the stormwater rule. So as a result, all sites will either install stormwater treatment on site or pay an impact fee. Um, you know, just, just to emphasize, it's, it's not optional. You know, you can't just say, I don't want to put stormwater treatment on my site. I just want to pay a fee. You have to maximize the treatment on your site if you can. Uh, you pay an impact fee where treatment isn't feasible. The fees are uh, based on uh, per acre of impervious surface for which the treatment standard is not met. It's a sliding scale if you partially meet. Uh, for the channel protection standard, it's $25,000 per acre of impervious surface where the standard is not met. And the redevelopment standard is also $25,000 per acre, but because the, the $25,000 per acre was based on the water quality treatment standard. And because the redevelopment standard is essentially half of that, the fee works out to 12,500 per acre. So if for whatever reason, uh, based on the EFA, you were not able to meet the redevelopment standard at all, you'd be paying 12,500 per acre. As to what happens with the impact fees that are paid, uh, they go to uh, watershed specific funds. We have accounts set up for each of the um, TMDL lake segments and stormwater impaired waters and Lake Memphremagog. So where the project doesn't meet a standard, the water goes into the into the fund. And for projects that exceed standards, so let's say you met 100% of the water quality volume, you would be eligible to be um, paid at those same rates. Um, you know, we have a lot of projects, not a lot, but certainly a significant number of projects that we've seen over the years where, say, let's say you're a two-acre site and you're adding a half acre of impervious surface, um, and the half acre needs a permit, but the existing two acres does not. There has been no incentive for property owners to install stormwater treatment for the existing two acres, despite the fact that in some cases, you know, it would certainly be... Um, much more economical to treat those those two acres in conjunction with the, the you know, treating the runoff from the new impervious surface. Um, so in those cases, um, projects, if they do decide to treat runoff from existing impervious surface that does not otherwise need a permit, they're eligible to receive those fees. Uh, the department doesn't do anything else with those fees. We don't take a percentage and they don't go to other, other uses. Projects, um, are paid, I think we'll be um, yes, paying, um, paying impact fees uh, once per year and projects are eligible to be paid uh, based on the order in which the, their application to receive funds was received. So as, in terms of what's eligible, it's stormwater treatment only. Projects need to obtain an operational permit. They need to install the stormwater system and then apply to receive stormwater impact fees. All right, so let's say you are a three acre site. We've told you you need to apply. apply. What is the application process? Um, again, the you know, statute establishes the backstop of having everyone obtain permit coverage no later than 2023, and we need to do some as you know early, you know, starting now. Um, you know, when the Clean Water Act was passed in 2015, 2023 sounded like it was a ways out. Um, it took a while to adopt the stormwater rule and the general permit, and as such, we don't have a lot of time 
Um, you know, certainly we were aware of it and, and, and received a lot of public comment that uh, folks are concerned about uh, funding and they're concerned about there being you know, sufficient engineering uh, resources in the state to address all these sites in a timely fashion. Uh, the department is committed to providing as much funding as possible. But some of those funding programs are still under development. So uh, in response to the public comment that we received, we um, under the final general permit, we uh, revised the application process to be a two step process. And under the, uh, the first step, projects will file an initial application. Applications under a general permit are referred to as notices of intent or NOIs. So if I say NOI, I just mean permit application. So the first one, so you're a three acre site, uh, you were permitted years ago, you're coming in, you're renewing. At this point, you'll send in a really basic application, it includes project information. It will include uh, or will require an estimate of the amount of impervious surface on the site. That doesn't necessarily need to be a site survey. It, it will later. Um, you know, if there are existing site plans that can be used or, you know, aerial imagery, just going to say Vermont Atlas and digitizing the impervious surface to estimate the amount on site. Based on that initial application, projects will get a short term permit. It'll typically be good for only 18 months. Um, during that 18 month period, um, we'll certainly be encouraging um, uh, projects to start the site engineering process to, you know, to, to find their engineers, start working with their engineers and work with the department and other funding sources um, to prepare for their next application. So at the end of that 18 months before their permit expires, they reapply um, with the full application, again, an NOI. Um, so this application would require you know, the fully engineered site plans, designs of the stormwater system, a completed engineering feasibility analysis, where projects are required to pay impact fees. Those fees would be due um, as part of the application. We do want to work in a, a way to have, as part of the second step, a preliminary review. So yes, potentially step two would be a two-step process. Um, but what we want to avoid is, you know, given that you know these projects are uh, subject to an EFA and engineering feasibility analysis, we don't want projects going too far down a particular design route, only to find out that we aren't necessarily in agreement with the design engineer. So I don't think it's going to be a formal requirement, but I think built into our application materials and our guidance materials is going to be uh, a strong. Strong recommendation, and this possibility will make it a requirement. Um, I, I'm guessing not, but, um, but really, we just want to find the right point in the process to meet with the design engineers to get a sense of how they've undertaken the engineering feasibility analysis and um, review their initial estimate as to the uh, type and extent of stormwater treatment that they're going to be able to provide on site. Um, you know, we, we do that now informally on some of our larger projects. Some engineers just tend to do it, and we, we definitely find that those projects um, go through the review process a lot, a lot better than those that just come in cold. And I think that'll be especially true on these projects. They're going to be tough, um, a lot of them. Some will be easy, you know, plenty of room, sitting on great soils. Um, they'll be able to exceed standards that, you know, they'll be relatively easy. Others that are heavily constrained. Um, you know, you have underground utilities up against wetlands or town right of ways and so forth. Those are going to be hard. Um, as a result of, you know, this, this second application, projects will receive a full five year permit. All our permits are five years. For a while, we were able to issue 10 year authorizations. Wasn't a great idea, but anyhow, under statute, we can't anymore. So projects will receive up to a five year permit. During that permit term, projects will then be required to um, Construct the stormwater system that has been, you know, that was approved by the permit. So, you know, going with the two step process and giving folks the five year permit term to construct the stormwater system, you know, allows all of us collectively, you know, that is, you know, the engineers will work on it, um, the stormwater program who's assisting uh, our funding programs to develop uh, both the financial and technical assistance to get these projects um, completed. 
I've touched on funding several times. Um, it's certainly not my area of expertise, but we do work closely with the, um, the water investment division um, and uh, helping to identify potential funding strategies. You know, we anticipate the costs for the implementation of this program to run in the hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, we understand that not every site uh, or not every project um, you know, has the resources to undertake the, you know, the, incur the expenses that will be required. Um, so in order for this program to succeed, and by succeed, I mean everyone's able to obtain permit coverage and install the appropriate stormwater system, um, some level of funding is going to be necessary. Um, just touching on, on some of the programs that are under development, um, we have the Green Schools Initiative, which has been uh, being developed for, for a little while now um, using um, space that uses uh, Lake Champlain Basin Program funds. And we are, as I understand it, quite close to releasing a RFP, a request for proposals to hire a contractor to administer the program. And what the program will do is for participating schools, it will, using one or more engineering firms, uh, obtain permit coverage. So, you know, develop the, you know, the stormwater designs and complete the applications for the schools. I believe at no cost to the schools. And then as a second step, take a similar approach to actually constructing the required stormwater systems. Um, the Clean Water Initiative Program, which is part of the Water Investment Division, is continuing with its block grants. Um, block grant program is providing um, funding for both municipal and uh, privately owned three acre sites. Uh, there's a range of match or leveraging requirements depending on the project category. Uh, QIP will re be releasing its its funding policy for the coming fiscal year or the existing fiscal year, I forget which, um, soon. You know, and that'll identify what types of three acre projects are eligible and to what extent. Under um, Act 76, I believe by um, this time next year, the department needs to um, develop a developed lands implementation grant program. And one option is to use some of our existing SRF or state revolving loan funds to, um, to seed um, programs that will um, help get uh, funding out to um, both public and private three acre sites. In terms of next steps, um, you know, we have sent out and will continue to send out outreach letters. So, you know, all sites, well, most sites, I should say, there's some folks we're having a little trouble finding contact information for. Um, we've reached out to them. We've told them we believe they're a three acre site. Um, for those whose application date is coming up, we've reached out to them again. And we plan a series of outreach letters so folks can stay apprised of what their next steps are. Um, we'd like to provide some training for and, and with um, you know, our engineers out there uh, this winter. Um, you know, this, like our other uh, permit programs, application processes are, you know, fully online now. Um, we've had a, a lot of material to develop, both on the back end, getting our database ready to accept this new program and forms and so forth. We understand there's some glitches so far where, you know, we under expected that. Um, we're working through them. Uh, again, continuing to work on funding. Uh, with our partners and continuing to invest in um, tracking and reporting under, you know, the Clean Water Act and our obligations under the Champlain TMDLs. You know, we don't need to just keep track of, you know, permits. We also need to estimate and report on the amount of phosphorus um, reductions that we are achieving through all our various permit programs. What else? Um, just to touch on. It's, this is included in the general permit, but not because of the general permit. So also under Act 64, the permit threshold for operational permitting um, is going to be lowered as of July 1, 2022. Currently, it's one acre of impervious surface. It'll drop to one half acre. So a new development and redevelopment, or redevelopment being full depth reconstruction, say you're taking a parking lot and turning it into a building. If that involves half acre or more of impervious surface, as of next year, um, you'll be required to obtain an operational permit. This is an imp 
important change and it helps to reduce the phosphorus coming from new development. All these programs that I've been talking about in the three acre program are addressing stormwater from existing development, but in part that is to create the capacity in the lake for new development. So um, it's important that we get as much phosphorus reduction from stormwater from new development to reduce the burden on existing development. Uh, for information, you know, uh, please uh, you know, visit the Stormwater Program's website. You can search by Vermont General Permit 9050 or Three Acre Permit, any one of those things, or go to the address here. Um, if you've got questions on a particular project, if you go to our contacts page, you'll find the Stormwater Program contact person for your area, and you can start with them. You can always contact me. Um, also, we maintain an email distribution list if you're interested. Um, I, I think uh, Rachel will put my email in the uh, in the chat, but if you want to be added to that, please just send me an email. Um, it's an informal list. We don't use it for, you know, uh, permit public notice or anything like that, but just occasionally as we have a, you know, a, um, something significant going on here, we'll send an email out to folks. So with that, um, you know, shut the presentation down and we can go to the chat. Awesome, thank you, Patrick. Um, so we did have some good questions starting in the chat. Um, Holden had asked if the list of three acre sites was on the DEC webpage and Ben Copens responded with the link in the chat. Thanks, Ben. Um, yep. Uh, so for uh, the first question for you, Todd Menez asks, is the impact fee a one-time payment, not an annual fee? Yes, thanks, Todd. That's a good question. It's a one-time fee. You know, projects do pay annual operating fees, just like a new project would, but the impact fee is a one-time fee. Great. Uh, Gianna Petito asks, can money that goes to a project exceeding standards be used to cover the cost of design and installation of that project? So if a project exceeds standards and is eligible to receive impact fees, it's it's really just it's based on the formula, of the level of treatment provided. And, you know, by the time the project receives those fees, it's going to be constructed. So what the applicant does with those fees is entirely up to them. We used to in our, you know, our we, you know, stormwater program has been administering a stormwater offset program for you know a long time. And those include stormwater impact fees. Projects used to be eligible based on the costs of that they incurred installing those systems. And that was a lot of extra work. And that's why we moved to just this straight formula based on the level of treatment provided. Great. Um, Jennifer Gilbert asks, sites that are not identified on the list, but the owner can identify three plus acres of impervious surfaces will still be required to submit an application and are subject to fees of noncompliance. Yeah, um, you know, it, the, the requirement to have permit coverage is in statute. So whether we've identified them as a three acre site and notified them doesn't change the requirement to have permit coverage. Certainly if someone doesn't know and they haven't heard from us and we find out after the deadline, we would certainly work with them. Um, you know, projects don't get into, you know, enforcement action unless they're just, you know, choosing to not apply and being difficult. Thank you. Um, Cindy Jones from Town of Warren. Um, what if you have done an eco restoration grant funding for installation of stormwater filtration already in place? So for projects that have, have already installed stormwater systems as it, through um, any, any sort of program, um, be it you know, funded or unfunded, I mean, the level of treatment that exists on a site will be taken into account during the, the permit process. I, you know, if that question is getting into whether those projects can receive fees, I know, you know, uh, more recent grant language, you know, would disallow projects that receive funding from from the state to then turn around and apply to receive impact fees. But the site installed a stormwater system years ago as a result of a grant, there may not be any such prohibition. I don't know. Uh, Paul Boisvert asks, will the process for sites with expired permits be similar to that outlined for three acre sites? Um, so expired permits, 
if they are less than three acres, essentially will be um, renewed the way any other permit is renewed. So for those of you who work in stormwater, it would sort of be like a 90-10. The exception is there are some expired permits in stormwater impaired waters that are identified in flow restoration plans, um, but have less than three acres. In those cases, we'll be reviewing that application and likely making the determination that that project will need to upgrade um, and essentially meet three acre standards. We will give those projects some limited amount of time to, it'll essentially be like following the two step process for a three acre site. But expired, less than three acres, not identified in a flow restoration plan. And a flow restoration plan is the plan that an MS4 community develops to address uh, in a stormwater impaired water within their municipality. So they identify projects. Uh, but if the project's not there, not three acres, it's kind of like a standard 90-10 renewal. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Alicia Filler asks, is there an updated list of innovative treatment practices that have been approved by the state for underground treatment? Um, you know, all, all the approved practices are, are in the stormwater management manual. I think on our website where we've had um, a limited number of proprietary systems or new systems that have you know met the standards and been adopted. I think they are in there. I think I think they're on the website. Um, I'd have to I'd have to check in with with Kevin Burke in my program just to see precisely um, where that information is. You can reach out to him directly or or send me a note and I'll run it down. Awesome, thank you. Um, and for everybody, I did put Patrick's email in the chat if you'd like to contact him. Um, Pam DeAndrea asks, can you speak to the Green Schools program and how that will align with the permit for schools? Will that funding be available to schools that already have final designs or even 30% completed? Yeah, um, yeah, I touched on it earlier. Um, so yeah, I mean, so when the, when, when the, the contractor or contractors who are working on that, um, when they apply for permit coverage for the schools, they'll be taking into account um, the fact that some schools are, are really, you know, pretty much already have a stormwater system designed, whereas others are starting from scratch. So, you know, all that information will be made available to, to contractors working in that program. Okay. So, uh, I don't know if there's two parts to that. I forget if I missed a part or not. But. No, um, I think you answered it. Dave yeah, and Sarah missed, yeah. Coleman in the um, Water Investment Division is uh, is the best contact for questions on that program. David Miscal asks, I understand farms are exempt presently. Will that change? Um, I don't know. Um, yes, they are. They're, they are currently exempt. That's a statutory exemption. So um, yeah, it's not something, you know, my program has any um, say in. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a strict statutory exemption. Um, so yeah, I guess that's really in the legislature's hands. Um, Holden asks, are there recommendations for current or planned stormwater design implementation projects that could be used to meet future three acre permit requirements on three acre sites outside of the Lake Champlain or Memphis Magog basins? Hmm. Can't say. Follow that one. You mind repeating it? Yeah. Um, are there recommendations for current or planned stormwater design and implementation projects that could be used to meet future three acre permit requirements on three acre sites outside of the Lake Champlain and Memphis Magog basins? Um, yeah, I guess I, I don't quite, I don't fully get it, but um, you know, certainly the, the, the the standards that we're using within the Lake Champlain Basin and Memphis Magog um, will be applicable outside those watersheds as well. Those those projects don't yet have that permit requirement. But Holden, if I'm missing it and you want to follow up offline, uh, please do send me an email. Great. Um, Ed Larson asks, why do we need this permit if we have a MSG and an up-to-date SWPPP? Sure, we have, um, so that refers to the MSGP is the multi-sector general permit and it, it applies to uh, industrial sites. 
um, all industrial projects uh, in the state pretty much require permit coverage there and um, they're required to have a stormwater pollution prevention plan a swip um, the, the reason that projects require both is they essentially do different things um, the dust the requirement for the industrial permit for the MSG, msgp coverage is tied to the activity of the site so the moment that a project ceases industrial activity or even if it changes ownership you know they either need to obtain different permit coverage or they no longer need permit coverage um, the treatment standards are different as well under the multi-sector program the the intent is to minimize exposure of um, uh, materials that can contribute to industrial related stormwater pollution you know so it, it encourages projects to keep as much of the as much of the raw materials under cover whereas the you know the three acre general permit is designed to address stormwater from impervious surfaces and to re and, and require treatment um, we did give consideration to um, combining those permits but um, you know again because the trigger for the industrial permit coverage is tied to the activity as opposed to the what's on the ground that frankly seemed to create more trouble than it than it solved but we appreciate the frustration uh, you know that projects are feeling about having to have more than one stormwater permit thank you um elizabeth emmons asks if the site discharges stormwater to a municipal stormwater collection system that has a treatment system will they re be required to install treatment on their own site if, if you know if it i, I think you i think the comment's clear um if by municipal system you mean wastewater so if it's a combined system and that stormwater is going to a wastewater treatment plant then they do not need permit coverage um, there aren't many of those um, if it is going to a municipal system that's providing treatment if the municipality joins as co-permittee um, on the stormwater permit then that's acceptable the, the stormwater treatment can be located off-site it's just whoever owns that off-site stormwater system needs to also be on the permit for the subject three acre site great um pam deandre asks when will the notice of intent be due yeah there's uh, i refer back to one of the earlier slides um it, it depends uh, if it's uh, an existing permitted um, site that's due before the permit expires um, if it's an unpermitted site currently uh, it's based on their watershed and again we'll be using a two-step application process um, so yeah I, I, I take it the presentation will be made available um, I'd refer folks back to that earlier slide any questions please do reach out yes the um, the presentation will be available on our web page um, and I'll post a link to that in our chat um, from Holden how technical are the basic project information questions in the initial application such as can a lay non-engineer person answer them the application does um, by rule need to be completed by an engineer um, some of the other you know the, the basic administrative information can be uh, completed by by you know the landowner um, but the application and the estimate of impervious surface does need to be completed by a licensed professional engineer great um, John Armstrong asks, when under three acre permits are expiring and are renewed under 3-9050, using the new eNOI process, will they have to input the newly required information for each discharge point? If you need me to repeat that, I can. Yeah, um, certainly for the three acre sites, we need the, um, and I think for all renewals, we are requiring that the discharge point information be renewed. Um, I'd have to double check as to whether that's true for both three acre and sub three acre. Great. Um, Ed Larson asks, if the goal is to eliminate stormwater discharges, then why are you doubling up on us? We're out of business. Yeah, I guess nothing else to add on that. Yeah. Um, all right and so far that is the questions in the chat um i'd like to open up if anybody maybe holden wants to um 
reiterate his question that we didn't quite understand before, feel free to anybody raise your hand and we can unmute you or you can unmute yourself and ask. I'd just like to add if you are on the phone, you could press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you, Jordan. Hi, Patrick. This is Gianna from the Winooski Conservation District. Um, I think I, I heard you correctly that the, there might be some funding to assist some of these private properties um, through the revolving loan fund or maybe the design implementation block grants, but none of those would then be eligible for the impact fee. That's correct, right? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, thank you. We have another question in the chat from David Wilcox. How is impermeable surface, sorry, how is impermeable surface determined in a forest land setting? Are forestry practices exempt like they are for the stormwater permits? Yeah, so I mean, you know, the three acre permit is, is an operational permit and under statute, um, silvicultural practices. So, you know, a, a logging road where those projects are subject to and compliant with um, AMPs, acceptable management practices for, for forest forestry activities, um, those projects are exempt. Thank you. Once again, if anybody would like to raise a hand or unmute to ask a question, feel free to do so. All right, well, uh, again, I appreciate everybody tuning in. Appreciate the good questions. If you think of anything, Afterwards, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me or others in my program. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Patrick. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and once again, everything will be available on our web page. And I'll notify everyone who's re registered of when the um, recording is available. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Appreciate it. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye.